please ushers kindly make sure that our MIIF executive will put this side from us. Thank you. And in due time, we will be able to acknowledge all our special guests for this program. Hello. So, I will call upon the first gentleman of the land and the host of this program to give us the welcome address, the VC. of this program. At the beginning of last year, UMAT adopted some of the sustainable development goals for university-wide research. Out of the 17 sustainable development goals, we chose eight of them for lecturers and students to do research in so that we can help to make this our space more sustainable. In addition to that, we selected some of these global observance days, and throughout the year, we try to celebrate some of them. One of the days we selected is the World Industrialization Day. And the idea is to have our faculty of engineering promote an agenda in industrialization. It's all about making sure that Ghana develops. It's all about making sure that uni the university contributes towards the agenda that the president has set. That is the Ghana Beyond Aid. If the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda is to come to pass, it will ride on the path of industrialization. And we as a university would want to push an agenda in that direction. It is therefore a delight to be part of this program on industrialization. And the direction that we are moving this particular program is interesting from supply chains. And um, I believe that we have a wonderful person to talk to us about that. Without question, industrialization and local value addition is the way forward for Ghana. And we at UMAT intend to build the world-class human capital that will make this possible and to support this agenda of Ghana beyond it. It is important that MIF is also here. MIF is the Minerals Income Investment Fund. And if MIF can partner UMAT in such a program, then it is just wonderful. At the appropriate time, we will give the acknowledgments. But for me, this is just beautiful. The CEO of MIF is here, the speaker is here, and I believe that we will give them the chance to roll as it is go back. Thank you very much. Can we do it better for the Vice Chancellor? We have big men in our midst. We have the professors, the doctors, the ministers and mistresses. We have the students. The industry players are also in our midst. Can the professors give us a week. The professors in our midst. You can do it better for them. Now is the turn of the doctors. The doctors give us a shout. The doctors are missing. Let's move to the mistress and mistresses. Can you do it better with a clap? 
And now our distinguished students, you can give her a shout. Now we have a spoken word for this program. And shall we invite Stephen and Emanuela? Stephen and Emanuela for the spoken word. You can do it better as they come. Stephen and Emanuela. Okay. In the uh, absence, let's take one or two views before we continue the program. And we have our registrar in our midst. Sir, your expectation for this program. Thank you, MC. Uh, as you said, you know, we have selected this day. And we expect that at the end of the lecture, we would understand it very well and, that, and know the role we have to play in industrialization. And we are grateful to the sponsors and we hope that they will continue to do that. So it's part of my expectation. Thank you very much. Knowledge about that, we'll be able to take advantage of the information that we we'll get from there and then we we'll leverage upon it. Thank you very much. We can do it better for progress. Prof, uh, when you talk about um, supply chain, mostly um, you talk about the procurement and things um, as an engineer and a professor. What will be your message for all gathered here before the speaker mounts the stage? Hello. Yeah, this guy has put me on the spot. But in my capacity as the Dean of School of Postgraduate Studies, I know that I have a lot of students here. Can you give a wave? Okay, thank you very much. I have a lot of students from the Department of Management Studies and the Engineering Department. So I will entreat the students to pay attention to the speaker. The speaker is the board chair of the Minerals Income Investment Fund. And I believe is the reason why the mining companies are also here. I know some of them are here in their capacity as students, but some are also here representing the companies, and that is good. So Minerals Income Investment Fund, I'll not give a lecture on it. The CEO himself is around. But I just want to say that the fund is to manage the royalties from the mining companies and invest in social capital and therefore all the communities will benefit from the work that MIF is going to do. Supply chain is everywhere and therefore we all must pay attention and get something into our pockets before we leave here. Thank you. Can we do it better? Okay, so let's move to the industry players. Sir, please, um, your name. I'm Richard. Richard. So far, you've been in the industry for some time now. Can you share with us one or two experiences that you've had as far as our topic is concerned? are not what we expect. So today we are here to hear from the speaker one of the words 
to go about it for another one week. Thank you. Right. Let's clap for him. I've seen the HUD for management studies. He's an industry player as well. With vast experience. Sir, your message to prepare the minds of the students and everyone that are here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mark. Um, I think we are privileged to have Professor Douglas Boati in our midst today. Um, he is a man that um, is supply chain and industrialization. So if today we have him here, I think it's an honor. We are all the, uh, the lecture and make sure we implement most of the stuff that he's going to share with you for those who teach and research uh, in the area of um, supply chain so it's um, it's a good opportunity uh, for us as researchers and uh, to our students to actually enjoy today and consume what he's prepared you know, for us thank you right that is Dr. Frank Boatin. As we wait for the CEO Right. There is another big man with me. I know him from the media. He's well experienced a politician and he is the head of corporate affairs for MIIF. So we will take one or two words from Mr. Kajofred Pong. Thank you very much. No, this is not official at all, so don't clap. I beg you. You're going to have to do more clapping when the officials start speaking. So please reserve your energy. Or you want to practice it. Can we practice how we we'll clap today? Hey, engineering students. Or you want me to say, if X equals... Huh? If X equals Y, then X squared minus 4 equals what? 5, 4, 3, 2, 8. Okay, guys, so some quick housekeeping rules. I understand that there should be social distancing. So we leave one seat. That the seat next to you should not be occupied. The seat next to you should not be occupied. So let's apply that rule across board, right? And I need the people at the back to come to the front, to the right. Can I get, can I get some movement, please? If you know you're at the back, can I get some movement towards the right? Because we are beaming this live on Facebook. We want to ensure that the people have a good image about this program. So kindly move up. at the back. I thought engineering students always sat in front and mathematics students always sat in front. We the people, the arts people, we are the back, 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 back. For example, all of these places are occupied, and I don't know why. Can you please? Okay, let's do this. 
move two steps, three steps forward from where you are seated. Three steps forward, please. Two steps forward, three steps forward. Two steps forward, three steps forward, please. Two steps forward, three steps forward. Just not the front here. Not the front here. Yeah. Two steps forward, yeah. Just let's evenly distribute the figures. Two steps forward. Yeah. Thank you very much. And kindly leave the seat next to you unoccupied. Leave the seat next to you. Even the MCs are breaking the rule. Thank you very much. Leave the seat next to you unoccupied. Mr. Bannon, kindly say where you are. Kindly say where you are. It's okay. Actually, sit next. Next to you. All right? We don't want people to come and interfere with the lecture. All right? So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, can we practice some applause, you know? A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. This is Pentecost. This is Pentecost. I want... No, this is Presby. I want Pentecost. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, this is Pentecost. Now I want I ICGC. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Great, great. Now I want our you. Do you guys know how are you? Eh? Oh, Musama Disco Crystal. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. No, that should be accompanied with woo -hoo, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. Great, 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 great. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to go back to the MC for the morning. Can I get everybody seated, please? Can I get everybody seated? No movement in the, in the auditorium. Everybody's seated. Good, 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 good. Yeah. So, ushers, now you can evenly distribute those who come. You can evenly distribute those who come. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you so much. So I'll bring on to the mic your regular MC. Can we give him an hour you? Absence. Shall we call on Professor C.K. Amuzvi to introduce to us the CEO of MIF? Dr. Professor C.K. Amuzuvi is the Dean for the Faculty of Engineering and they are the host for this program. You can do it better for him. Hello, good morning, all of you. 
Nana Yao Kuranti Edward is a lawyer and a banker. He has many years of experience in the oil and gas industry, mining, and international business. He has worked in several organizations in Ghana, the United Kingdom, and East Africa. He has a dream of creating the biggest minerals fund in Africa, expecting around 500 million US dollars assets under management by 2025. It is my singular honor and privilege to invite and welcome the Chief Executive Officer of the Minerals Income Investment Fund. Good morning, Vice Chancellor, my own board chairman, Professor Douglas Boating, the professorial body, and the students of this esteemed organization. I wouldn't say it's my singular honor. I think on behalf of the management and executive of the Minerals Income Investment Fund, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of you for inviting us here, um, but no, not just inviting us, but allowing us to partner with you on these uh, uh, series of leadership dialogue or leadership series that um, was birthed with your vice chancellor and my board chairman, I think just a couple of weeks well, or months ago. Um, we, we want this to be one of the uh, most esteemed series of talks on the West African coast. I think Kojo Fimpong will always say, uh, Mr. Kranti always sets ambitious targets. But I think that's how it should be. And um, I'm extremely delighted to be here at UMAT. I believe we're the very best and brightest students in engineering and mathematics. One area I should say I fall short with, with, with over 25 years of banking. Uh, when I tell people that I just can't do mathematics or statistics, they just look at me in shock. But I see engineers and uh, mathematicians as the brightest of all. And I actually think engineers make the best bankers in the world. And that's a fact, actually. So so I'm really, I'm really honored to be here. I, I know from here we expect our next Professor Alotis, Albert Einstein's, the Nikola Tesla's, Elon Musk's, and the like. I think that's really possible. And um, these series are supposed to give us that push by people, people like Professor Douglas Boatin, who's seen it all and done it all, and give us that motivation that being the Tesla's and Einstein's, is actually very possible. And that is why I'm so honored um, to be part of this. I know this university is the best in West Africa in terms of mining and engineering studies. And this is why at the Minerals Income Investment Fund, we see a partnership with this university as crucial for de developing the thought leadership that continuously increases the value of mining to our people. What we are doing here and what we are starting here with a good professor is absolutely essential and it must be projected for the growth and development of the mining sector. Now you may all be wondering what the Minerals Income Investment Fund is all about. Um, since I came to Takwa 
even with the mining companies, even with our own, some of our own MPs. Um, a lot do not understand or know what the Minerals Income Investment Fund is all about, or what we call MIF. So just for perspective, allow me to give you one minute, just one minute or 30 seconds of what we do. The Minerals Income Investment Fund was set up by statute, what we call the Act 978, as amended in 2019, by the government of Ghana. The government realized that a lot of our minerals income, our royalties, dividend, just maybe times moves into the consolidated fund. And we are, not, we, are, we are not really able to account for this and how these um, um, dividend and royalties really impact on the development of the mining sector. So we created a fund called the Minerals Income Investment Fund. What we do is essentially manage the equity interest of governments, the equity interest of government in the mining companies. I'm sure you all are aware that the um, uh, government of Ghana has a 10% carried interest in all mining companies, the, 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 the international mining companies. So the gold fields, the new months, etc. We do have 10% equity interest. And then um, for, for that 10% equity interest, MIF is responsible in managing that interest for government. So the dividend comes to us, and we need to find ways and means to invest that um, um, dividend for the future of Ghana, for all of us. And then there are royalties. I'm sure you all know what royalties are. Royalties are simply taxes. These are taxes on production, which you know, I believe you all know. So again, government wanted to streamline the, the, these royalties, see what we can do with these royalties as we see in places like Canada, Australia, etc. You know, they develop on the back of some of these streams uh, or tax streams. So government thought it's wise that, you know, let's place these royalties in the hands of MIF. MIF will aggregate all these royalties and invest these royalties. So it's not only gold, but we're even looking at sand winning, we look at salt, we look at granite, limestone, um, uh, bauxite is not included. Uh, we look at uh, diamonds, etc. These are all the minerals that uh, MIF looks at, so it takes care of. So under this, these royalties come to us, and then we invest um, these royalties. That's why we are a fund. So, so, in short, we play a very essential role in the development of the mining sector um, in Ghana. We, we just don't uh, want to invest the funds. Um, so when we collect the royalties, we give 20% of these royalties to the Minerals Development Fund. I believe you all know the Mineral Development Fund. Uh, we give 20% of these royalties, Mineral Development Fund, and the fund, that fund will then invest in the local communities. So in short, that is what we do. And I think with the able leadership of, of a very uh, strong board, uh, which is led by Professor Douglas Barty, and of course, one of your very own, and one of our very good friends, I don't know whether she's here. Yes, she's actually here. Madam, can we see you, please? Let's give a big round of applause to Prof. So, so Prof and, uh, and my own Prof, uh, 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 who is the board chairman, they lead this, um, I, I don't want to use the word crusade, but in a way it is, for us to become the biggest fund in Africa. And I think Kujo mentioned it. So I'll leave the board chairman who's our distinguished speaker today, to speak more about MIF. Um, I don't think he needs to, because I believe that you have a fair idea of what you do and who we are. But I'm very proud to say, and um, maybe I don't know whether I'm supposed to introduce him, but I think it's befitting if I introduce him. Because um, this series has been, to a large extent, it's actually under the partnership with, with, um, with UMAD. And it's going to be a series that is going to run at least for the next 100 years. where every year we will be celebrating and honoring a distinguished Ghanaian. 
So ladies and gentlemen, if you allow me, Vice Chancellor, that we all be upstanding, and I take this singular honor in inviting my own board chairman, Professor Emeritus Douglas Boate, to deliver his address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable CEO. Please, let's be seated. And st I'm standing here with um, Professor Douglas Boatin for a few minutes before he takes off. Um, the CEO that you met standing here a few seconds ago is a big man. And the kind of association that UMAT has with me is going to create a lot of value for the university. I talked about the fact that we are working with the Sustainable Development Goals. And the last one, the 17th SDG, talks about partnership. And for the next few years, our partnership with MIT is so deep that we are going to invest $4 million in the university, <laughs> starting from the next few weeks. They are going to build for us an engineering materials testing center. And we are going to call it the MIT Engineering Materials Testing Center. In addition to that, you see the center is going to cost about $3.5 million. And they have accepted it and budgeted for it for this year. In addition to that, they are going to give us a jewelry workshop at the cost of $750,000 so that we can start our program certificate in jewelry making and metal smithing. He introduced his board chairman. But before he speaks, let me mention one or two things about him. That is why I'm here with him. Professor Douglas Boateng, Africa's first ever appointed professor extraordinaire for supply and value chain management, is an international professional, certified chartered director, and an agent academic, independently recognized as one of the vertical specific global strategic thinkers on procurement, governance, logistics, and industrial engineering in the context of supply chain management. He continues to play leading academic and industrial roles in supply chain strategy development and implementation in both Africa and around the world. He is recognized for his contribution to the advancement of local and international aspects of supply chain management. And he was honored with the Platinum Lifetime Global Achievement Award in 2016 and the Lifetime Achievement Award. In addition, Professor Boatin has been publicly acknowledged by leading institutions, including the Commonwealth Business Council, for his ongoing contribution to international procurement, supply chain development, and governance, and the link, and its link to emerging world long-term socioeconomic development. He is the board chairman of the MIF and the past chairman of the Public Procurement Authority. For those who are from Opokuari here, He's a Katechi. And one thing you don't know about him is that he was my classmate at KNUST Primary School. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Douglas Boati.
Good morning. Good morning, good morning, colleagues. It's indeed an honor to be here. And thank you very much to MIF and uh, the university for putting this um, lecture together. I'm indeed honored, and I thank you very much. And also, our good CEO, Mr. Francis, for agreeing to sponsor this event. Today's uh, presentation is about supply chain management and this inextricable link to our long-term social economic future. Today, yesterday, my good old colleagues, when I was uh, on my way here from Tap Riding, I had to do a lot of reflection. Uh, thank God, my back is in good shape. But the road from Takra to Takwa was indeed an eye opener for me. And then when I was sitting in the car, I was asking myself, why? After so many years of mining, why is it that we have such poor roads? Takwa is one of the richest bridges on the continent. Everything from gold, manganese, even bauxite apparently is here, and now lithium, and then the soil. So we store a lot of rubber. Develop. There will be no need for such a 
down the line, what are we going to show? The road is Kaba. And we have to find a way of doing uh, better than that. And that is where supply chain management comes. So, my distinguished guests and students in this hall, contrary to popular belief, In the US, when they are in trouble, what do they do? They talk out in their economy. In Ghana, when we are in trouble, we talk down and then you make the West. As patriotic citizens of this country, of course we have issues. But let's not belittle our own Ghana. We are not broke. We have challenges. We have financial issues. But we can solve it. Ghana has made positive strides since 1957. We have grown from 4.98 billion in 2000 to 72.35 billion in 2020. The biggest growth I can tell you, you can check the numbers yourself, was between 2000 and 2008, and then from 2016 to 2019, until COVID broke. Between 2008 and there was marginal increase, yes, but the spectacular increases in our GDP, 2000 to 2008, in 2016 to 2019. The capital income has also grown from 1.588 US dollars to 2329 in 2020. Tax to GDP ratio, which was in 2007.8, has now shot up to 14.1. It has dropped because of COVID to 12.5 we were on the right path to achieving 20 to 25, which is needed for job creation for your good selves. Democracy, we know you are, we are doing much, much better. We are the black stars of democracy in Africa. Of course, until I think it was December 17th, when the hooligans in parliament, you know, created the unfortunate scenes Yes, they have their reasons for doing that, but that was certainly uncalled for. I say it as it is, it was wrong. They could have found a better way of, you know, addressing their differences. Manufacturing, contribution to GDP has also grown. It was 3.7 in 2015. Today it's 10.44 in 2019. That is not bad. When manufacturing grows, there's what you call supply chain and industrialization also happening. We are gradually moving forward, and the president's vision with 1D, 1F, we all need to support it. Yes, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, a visionary leader, started it in the 60s with what is called the industrialization agenda for Ghana. That is why he created the likes of Gehok for food and beverages, for the shoes and things that we wear, um, for sugar, you name it. But today, it's all collapsed. We have what we call in Ghana, Kotobeton. And Kotobeton has its implications because what it does is it kills local industry. And the president is trying to revive that with 1D, 1F. As a society, we are really driven by price and not about value and also the unintended consequences of what we acquire. Having done a lot of studying and research over the last 13 years on what 
especially women, they use their money for. It dawned on me that women have a role to play in terms of the industrialization agenda. I can categorically tell you here that over 99% of the people sitting in here, the underwear that you've got on, at least those that have one on today, you don't know where it's coming from. It's a fact. You are driven by price. And women spend over 600 million US dollars every year on underwear. That was in 2014. Now, just imagine those underwear were produced in Africa, the amount of jobs that it will create. These are some of the things that is hampering our industrialization because we are driven by imports and cheap things. We also have a challenge, colleagues, with our state-owned entities that are supposed to be the driver of economic development. There's a lot of interferences in the state-owned entities due to lack of supply chain thinking. So you have what is called silo thinking. Each state-owned entity is doing their own thing. There is no integration. Supply chain management is there to try and break down that silos for the benefit of all. We all know what is happening. It's this top goal, things that happen in our economy. Brilliant projects from NDC, from MPP. When there's a change of power, it is abandoned. If there's supply chain thinking, you don't. You continue because there are implications for the entire value chain. We can do better, colleagues, but sometimes we are our own worst enemy. And I believe with supply chain thinking, we can do that. I mentioned this before. In 2014, I did the homework. Over 90% of our underwear is imported. If we cannot produce our own underwear, what hope do we have in terms of industrialization? It's coming from India, China. And they've mastered the art of making us believe that the other things are cheap, but not necessarily good, but we still buy it. This morning, in my hotel room, just this morning, the iron that I was using to iron my my shirt, I turn it to wall. I put it on my shirt, and then it was very hot. So there's a gaping hole in my shirt. Luckily, I came with a couple of shirts. I would have been standing here with a hole in my shirt. And it's because the hotel has obviously gone and bought something very cheap. And whether the drop was in Chinese and they tried to change it, I don't know. But be careful when you are going to hire your things in the hotel. Don't put it on warm. Put it on hot to get warm. Because otherwise, you are going to damage your shirt. Pharmaceuticals, vaccines, nutraceuticals, they are all imported. 99% of the bulk actives in Africa is imported. Now, with the exception of South Africa, they have very positive strides in terms of trying to create what is called a bulk active industry, which is positive. Ghana, under the president, obviously wants to make Ghana one of the main supply of vaccines because COVID gave him a serious and also the citizens a wake-up call that we cannot depend on our so-called developmental partners. Our textbooks, pens, you name it. How can a country that has so much, even wood, be importing matches from China? It does not make sense. But we can't keep blaming the Chinese and the Indians. Their fault is ours. And we have to find a way of resolving it. This is where we are. Ghana, we like to consume. This Christmas, look at the hampers that you got. How many of those things in the hamper was made in Ghana? Hundreds of millions of dollars was spent just giving away gifts. How many was from Ghana? We like to create jobs somewhere. 
And then we obviously blame that there are no jobs. Can this continue? The answer is no. Ghana is suddenly rising. Ghana is not broke. But the big question is, for who? When we keep exporting and we are giving these um, economic growth numbers, is it helping your good selves? For me, the answer is no. The target should be economic development. And you can only achieve economic development through supply chain management. What is a supply chain, my colleagues? A supply chain is a network of companies, internal and also processes that work together to achieve a common good. A common good includes satisfying the company, satisfying the customers, and increasingly satisfying society. Very important, take note. Supply chain management is not just about performance. It's also about national development. And I will share with you quite a few of the countries that have managed to do that. A supply chain exists in every single organization, be it a service industry or even government. There's a supply chain in Standard Bank. There's a supply chain in EcoBank. Even at UMAT, there's a supply chain. So if one part of the supply chain is not working, what happens is you have the ripple effect. Consequences. That is what supply chain is all about. Sometimes we confuse supply chain with just the tangible. No, 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 no. Some of the challenges that we face in our beloved country and also Africa is because of lack of supply chain thinking between government departments. Minister of Finance is a customer for the national planning and development. Minister of Finance is a customer and part of a supply chain for the Minister of Transport. So if the Minister of Transport gives the wrong budget to the Minister of Finance, the information that is being given is a product. And that product, if it's not right, has implications for budgeting. Now, sometimes our budgets are so skewed. It's not that it's the Minister of Finance that has got it wrong. It's the input from the various departments that creates the challenges for the Minister of Finance. Yes, there is waste in the public sector. But sometimes the data that is used to predict, believe you me, is out of sync in reality. So you get all this disconnect. Example of a supply chain network. When you walk into ShopRite, I did not see ShopRite in Takwa. Maybe one day it will come here, but I've not seen it yet. But everything on the shelf comes from somewhere. And there are entities within that chain that ensures that you get it at the right time, at the right cost, and at the right quality. It's the same thing that applies to information passing through departments. Even within MIF, we have departments. And each department is a customer of another department. So if HR gets it wrong by recruiting the wrong people, there's implications for the CEO. That is what supply chain thinking is all about. Think of the consequences of your actions on the next in the chain. Because when you do that, you have a harmonious chain. And now it's being extended to include building nations. That is what supply chain is simply all about. Pharmaceuticals, same thing from uh, the GMPC producing the chemicals to pharmachemical companies to pharmaceutical. By the time you take your paracetamol, it's going through all these processes. You don't see it by the somebody sitting behind managing it and also making sure it creates jobs. South Africa has managed to create one of the largest pharmaceutical companies from 1994. South Africa has managed to create one of the largest telco companies using supply chain thinking. We all use their product, MTN. Supply chain at its best. We all know Nando's. Nando's is another chain that is coming out of South Africa. It is my dream that one day, through MIF, we can create an industrial organization that will also be able to compete with the likes of Glencore, Trafigura, and we can do it. We have everything that we need to achieve that. There's a lot of confusion between supply chain management and procurement, they are not the same thing. 
for me, in 1998, I defined supply chain management as a set of processes that basically work together seamlessly in organizations to ensure that the output that comes out is fit for purpose and also for national development. 1998. And today is the definition that has been sort of adopted across the world. <laughs> Supply chain and economic growth and national development, regional-wise, is now intertwined. Without supply chain, you cannot achieve growth and development. If you talk about growth and you don't talk about development, you have a challenge. When the world tells us that Sierra Leone is growing at 25%, I ask myself, from what base? It's because they are shipping out their commodities and they are not developing. Go to Guinea and you will see what I'm talking about. Bauxite what it has done to Guinea. The abject poverty. But you see the GDP numbers. So interesting. Now, Ghana has moved beyond that. Ghana right now is more focused on economic development. Hence, there are frantic efforts and bold decisions slowly being made. But it needs your support. Because sometimes there's a, a pushback. And what for me, and I'm going to say it, the benchmark policy Reversa needs your support because Cotobeton is not helping us. It's not creating enough jobs. Yes, it creates jobs for you, but it's not enough. The only way we can create jobs for the future and current generation is for us to be able to do manufacturing locally. Look at the things that I'm wearing. A lot of this. These are outputs from mining. But where is it coming from? It's coming from China. Don't be surprised if the raw materials from this is from here, from Takwa. And it goes up and then it comes down again. Why? We can change it through supply chain thinking. Procurement, again, let me repeat, it is not supply chain management, but part of it. If you look at the diagram, you will see that it's a subset. And the key is economic development. I did not mention economic growth because for me, development is what creates the jobs. Not when you are shipping your raw materials and then you are giving these fancy figures of 5, 10, 20% um, economic growth. Economic development and in, um, industrialization are one of the same thing. The citizen is the key factor. What you buy has an impact. Has the situation, supply chain issues, situation changed? No. It's all the same from 1970 to 2020. The only new thing that has come in is COVID. And I see COVID as an opportunity for all of us. Believe you me, a lot of companies have made a lot of money out of COVID. New industries have sprung up. It's also got an educational institution to think about how we deliver our you know, courses. Online education is now huge. The objectives, it is about economic development. Performance, yes, but national development and economic development. Very, very important. A lot of companies have managed to do that. McDonald's, Wimpy, KFC, Amazon, ADM, Cargo, you name it, they've done it. There are quite a few Ghanaian companies that are also coming through. Still small, but it's just a matter of time, but they need our support. The mining sector, the Anglo-Americans, and the Anglo-Gold of this world, they've perfected the art, the new month. They've also done quite well. Education, MIT, these days you see MIT, Harvard Business School, Cambridge, Judge, they are all using supply chain principles to extend their market reach. So you see companies, uh, these institutions, setting up in Ghana, in, um, in the Middle East, satellite offices and they are applying the concept of supply chain management. It's my dream that one day you, Matt, could set up a satellite school in Guinea, in South Africa, in Sierra Leone, in Brazil. I don't see the reason why they can't do that. I tell the vice chancellor that one day you, Matt, should be the MIT of at least 
West Africa. <clears throat> Education is a big industry. And through industrialization and supply chain principles, we can harness and create jobs for our educators. You know, Nigeria alone spends over 500 million every year taking their kids to the UK. I don't see why they cannot come to Ghana. Even if we get 20% of that, that is $100 million to our economy. And when they come, they will leave somewhere, they will eat. They will go to hospital. So they're already feeding into those various supply chains. That is what supply chain thinking does. You think beyond your own because you know the impact. Impact of supply chain management. You know these countries. The South Korea, the Japan, and Singapore. In 20, 20 years, they were able to turn around. Increase some of the largest companies in the world. Kenya is doing extremely well in terms of becoming the hub for East Africa. The hub should have been in Tanzania, but Tanzania was asleep. So Kenya is gradually becoming the hub for Eastern Africa. Rwanda is trying to do its bit, but their position makes it very, very difficult. Ghana is ideally positioned. Already, we are called the gateway into the West African sub-region. So we are extremely positioned to become a gateway. And when you become a gateway, there's a lot of jobs. The president is pushing the agenda, the Beyond Aid agenda, and obviously attracting. I hope that obviously after he's gone, it continues. Because there's no turning back. If we go back, then we're retrogressing, and it's going to impact. It's not. The concept of Ghana beyond it doesn't belong to President Narakufuado. It belongs to Ghanaians. So it's Ghanaians that has to make it work. Gone are the days when it comes from MPP, NDC, becomes an issue. I think we need to think beyond the politics and look at what is the interest of Ghana. I'm not apologetic of being a nationalist and a pan-Africanist because this is what drives economic development. China had a plan for... 20 years, and they've done it. Ghana, we can do it. We've got the human capital, we've got the peace, and we've got the raw materials. It's just a matter of having a mindset change, and then we'll be able to create the jobs and build the Ghana we all desire through supply chain thinking. I give you this example because I want to show you what South Africa has managed to do within, um, from 1994 to date. They created some of the largest companies in the world using supply chain thinking. I mentioned one or two uh, for you. MTN, Aspen. Now they are shipping companies. Now when you go to our shops, at the hotel, again, I was looking for a kumfi juice. There's no a kumfi juice. There's series. Just look around when you are driving from Takwa to Hilda Hotel, the amount of oranges that are on the streets being sold by the women, how many of them are going to rot after two weeks? And then we go and use our foreign currency to go and import. I'm not against exports and imports, but we have to find a creative way of supporting our own through supply chain thinking. Anytime you buy series, you are affecting our mother that is sitting in the rural area, basically planting the oranges. South Africa has what is called proudly South African. Ghana has proudly Ghanaian. I believe you have proudly African so that we can break down the barriers but we need to support our own for them to get critical mass so that they can compete. Because right now, they are not being able to compete because we are not buying them. And it's got to the point where we don't even believe that our products are quality. A couple of years ago, it's about three years ago, I was so hungry sitting in a car and then I saw Bog and Katia. 
So I wanted to buy one. You know what the lady did? When she came next to the car, she told me, this is from Germany and this is from Ghana. This is, the Germany one is better. While she's holding two products. So we, we've even lost confidence in our own product. I make the example of the Milo versus Royale. Royale is one of the best products for the ticker. I hope you know what the ticker means. The one that keeps me standing here because if it stops, I'm gone. It's good. Far better than Milo. But we all prefer Milo. I'm not saying don't buy Milo. But I'm saying if you buy two Royal, you buy one Milo. Because that is feeding directly. The company that manufactures and produces Royal is owned by you and me. CPC. But we are not supporting. Why do we still have tea break? Why don't we have chocolate break? So that you can change our mindset. Because whatever happens at the front end feeds directly all the way to the cocoa farms. That is supply chain thinking. Anytime I go to the shop and I'm buying something, I look at the back. Where is it made? Made in Ghana. And I'm prepared to pay a bit more because I know I'm supporting my mother in the rural area. I drum this in the South Africans. Right now, it's paying dividends. They are doing that. A lot of the people in the townships, they are now buying made in South Africa. We can do the same here. Yes, we need import substitutes, but there's a limit to that. You can't just go and ship things to America, can you? No. Same in the UK, because they protect certain industries. I'm not a protectionist, but I believe in creative safeguarding of certain sectors. Our tomatoes has collapsed. We used to have our own tomato factory. It's gone. The rubber is gone. Now we produce the raw material, and it's being shipped out. And we had firestone. We can change that paradigm. Supply chain is about collaboration and industrialization is about basically applying supply chain principles to add value to local produce. So gold, we produce and we have this, you know, they, they like to play with us. Our brothers from the Western world. Oh, Ghana is the largest producer of gold on the continent. And then we get excited. Look at your road in Takwa. That should remind you that you can be the largest gold producer. But if you are not the largest jewelry, please take note of this. Jewelry uh, producer in the world, you will still have that gold, <laughs> that uh, road in 50 years. We go to change our mindset. We are the second largest producer of cocoa in the world. How much do we earn from it? Two billion, we have to even go and borrow every year, two billion to buy from the cocoa farmers. That market alone is worth over 100 billion, but we get only two billion because of lack of supply chain and industrialization thinking. We can change that. 1D1F, let me repeat, is a good initiative and we all need to support it. It is for your own good and it will help with the infrastructure development that we need. I put there the consumer factor because whatever you buy has implications for development. The main drivers, strategic leadership, we've got this 1D1F, we have to make it work. The government has set up MIF to try and streamline the mining sector and also help it to grow and also use it as a means to um, basically empower Ghanaians. We are creating mortar billionaires out there, but there's no Ghanaian that is a billionaire. Why? We must not be apologetic about empowering our own. In the early 
2010s, when I used to travel between South Africa and um, Ghana, there was a place in Tanzania whereby there was gold. Some Canadians came, they were artisanal miners, and they gave $5 million to the owner of the property and a, a white Toyota Prado. They did a little bit of soil sampling and some trenching work, and then they went to list six months later on the Canadian Stock Exchange. From five million US dollars they invested, let's say they spent 10 million. Six months later, that property was worth $947 million. Do you think that is not happening in Ghana? It is. Now, MIF's role is to try and minimize that. And MIF is going to spend money on exploration, but targeted. Because if you don't know the value of what you have, somebody will determine the value for you. And MIF's role is to prevent that. And whilst Mr. Cranting and myself are there, we are going to do whatever we can to protect what we have for Ghanaians. You know, I've shown you this, industrialization and economic development. What happens is if we apply supply chain principles, we are able to achieve economic development. The money is not in the raw material. The money is in the value addition. Please take note of that. Raw materials, one day will run out, and then what? The benefits, we all know. I don't need to be a rocket scientist. There are jobs to be created. Our infrastructure will definitely improve. We've got a brilliant idea. Let's educate the next coming generation through free HSS. Now we are struggling to find the finances. With industrialization, we'll be able to afford that. Hence, 1D1F and the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. It also fosters entrepreneurship. Our political stability is dependent on our economic stability. Please remember that. Yes, we are patient. We are very peaceful people. But when the stomach is angry, sometimes you get a bit dulali in terms of what is in the best interest of the country. The impact of supply chain management and, in, and, and industrialization. I've shown you this. I want to explain with tomatoes. Why should we be importing so much tomatoes? It doesn't make sense to me. When we have such fertile land, when we go to the shops, Italy has created a supply chain whereby they produce the tomatoes and it goes to China, it's put in uh, 10 cans and then it comes to Ghana and then obviously it's branded. Why can't you also do the same? We have the land. Do you think if there were jobs, the people in the rural areas, they were getting jobs and their houses were being offtaked. Do you think they will be galam say? No. It's because they are not getting their products taken. They farm, nobody but they come and stand by the roadside every day. They sit there all day, they make maybe 10 CDs, if they are lucky. And then this thing came and they said it's a it's, it's, it's a good alternative. I can make quick money. But they don't think of the supply chain implications. Sometimes I'm very, very sad when I see the implications of the polluted water on the kids. We are sitting on a ticking time bomb. The after effects, they drink the water. Long-term implications. And we can avoid that. You see, here, this is an example which I've been drumming in in South Africa and it's working. Most Ghanaians will go for the 80 cents. Let's call it 80 pesos because it's cheap. But what have you done? You have basically created a job in Italy and disenfranchised your own. For me, I think you should be prepared to spend a bit more because eventually the price drops. Very good music. What are the benefits of the industrialization? Frustration and anger. What basically happens is, 
the youth become very disillusioned with high unemployment, lower living standards, dependent on imports. We also saw what happened with COVID. They tell us they are bringing it, but they don't. But thank God, the Almighty protected us. Also, the president and his team was able to manage the, the, the situation extremely well. You know, now, fellow, fellow citizens and fellow Ghanaians, you, you hear it in South Africa, fellow South Africans, fellow British. And it was started by our president because he wanted to get to closer to the people. And he managed to come up with this thing which is working for, for, for you know, other governments. Dependence on commodity exports. The largest producer of cocoa, the largest producer of um, gold, no, second largest producer of cocoa and the largest producer of gold in Africa. It doesn't mean anything. It's just basically making you feel good. Let's move towards beneficiation. Add value. How can a country that produces <coughs> more gold than any country on the continent don't have a refinery? Does it make sense? We have to change that paradigm. The short-term gain, long-term pain, pain syndrome has to change. It is for our own good. Just imagine if 40% of value addition were done to this, and even Ghana was to get 10% of this here, the jobs that it would create. We import everything. Now we are importing even salt, pencils. What we use to cook is all important. But you have aluminum here. Why don't you encourage our own pharmaceuticals? The shoes, I am guilty. I've got a foreign shoe on. 99% of the shoes in here is coming from outside. But we can change that paradigm. The police service, the boots, they order every year. But we go and buy from outside. Why? Go to your own parliament. Where is the furniture from? The legislator. And I ask myself, why? Why can't we at least pay more for locals to do it? Everything is coming from you know where. And I know because I've been there and I did my homework. When you go to the shop, they will tell you this is good quality, this is bad quality. In most cases, our own goes and pick the bad quality and they bring it to us and sell it at the same price of the good quality. We are not fooling anyone. We are fooling our own selves. Today, the ordinary African, go to the shops and check yourselves. Most of it is from outside. Why should we be importing cocoa pine when there's so much coconut? Why can't we do certain things to support the locals? And I say it's so simple. It's not as simple, Prof. Why is it not simple? We can make it simple. It's just supporting it. And once you support it, basically you are creating jobs. You are getting money into the kitty through taxes. It is doable. You don't need a rocket science and you don't need the IMF to come and tell us that we need to produce coconut juice locally. We don't need the IMF to come and tell us that we need to produce tomatoes locally. We don't need the IMF to come and tell us that we need to produce our jewelry locally. Can Ghana achieve long-term industrialization? Oh, yes, we can. But we need to view current challenges as opportunities. We need to move away from what I call the short-term gain through commodity exports. Let's do more processing to our cocoa. Let's do more processing to our manganese. It's all being transported. We should do more locally. It will cost money in the short term and it will be painful, but we have to do it for the sake of the next generation. We need to break down barriers through supply chain thinking. The barriers I mean, let's work together as a collective. As individual organizations, we are not. Why do you think we are here? Mr. Cranton and his vision to create 
the largest fund and most admired in Africa is also thinking about the human capital. He needs the people to be able to achieve his dream. That is why he supported us coming here. And you need to applaud him for that. You know, we talk about the issue of product development. How much funding goes into research and development? 0.01% or even less. And even that, we don't get it. The scientists need money to create new products. The scientists need money to be able to establish how much gold is under. Recently, you all saw in the newspapers, the lithium has gone to some Australian company. At what value? For me, through supply chain thinking, the likes of you should have been empowered. Do the initial exploration work. Let's understand what is there. Put a value. Then when you go, you can negotiate. You know what we do? In Africa, we do what is called bargaining. Bargaining and negotiations are two different things. When you negotiate, you agree to disagree and walk away because you know the value of what you have. When you bargain, you don't know what you have. So definitely, the value you don't know. And then when you go, then there's this haggle. I always make this example. Accra Cultural Center. I went there to buy a sculpture. I think when the guys saw me, I went to You know what he did? Something that will cost about 20 CDs. As soon as he saw me, he started to talk about where he's been. He said, okay, $100. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, no, no. I started to, you know, play the, the reverse psychology. I started to work. I said, okay, fine. I went. He said, okay, 50 Okay. 100 to 50, this is a good deal. I paid. I walked out, went to another three, four shoulders. It was 20 cities. I thought I was being smart, but I did not know the value. And that's what happens to us. We use our property our incredible minerals and metals, we go and negotiate, but not knowing the value. And that's where MIF hopefully will be able to assist. But within reason, of course, in terms of let's understand what we have, the value, before we go and engage our mining brothers and sisters from the another world. Mindset changes with God. I am a Pan-Africanist. I'm not apologetic about it. But think beyond Ghana, colleagues. Because if you think Ghanaian, your, your market is only 31 million people. If you think African, your market is 1.185. Hence, we have AFTA. AFTA to open up the markets. But the big question I keep asking, are we ready? Because if we don't prepare ourselves, there could be unintended consequences. South Africa is ready. They have all the systems in place. They have all the manufacturing hubs. And they are going to really do extremely well. I believe, Ghana, we can do that through supply chain thinking. We have to change our mindset and our paradigms and our strategies and our policies to um, obviously support the, the, the strategy to support the, the policy. So what can we do? I believe that we need to promote Made in Ghana producing Africa products. Ghana is well poised to do that. Already there are things happening um, in the society that is going to help with that. We need to develop human capital. Very, very important. We have to be long-term driven. Also critical. The short-term gain, long-term pain syndrome is not working for us. We have to change. We have to prepare ourselves for after. It is here to stay and it's going to make a lot of difference.
to the continent. But the big question is, will Ghanaians benefit? That requires a mindset change. I keep mentioning about this price gain. It's not helping us. We have to look at value gains, not price gains. We need to indoctrinate the African child that they need to support their own. Made in Ghana, made in Africa. Because we are all part of one people. There's no, no ocean separating us. We are all one people that's trekked along. If you go to Eastern Africa, the Maasai, they are borderless. Today they are in Tanzania. Tomorrow they will be in um, Addis Ababa. That is how we are. But these colonialists came and divided us, uh, which is obviously making it very, very difficult. MTN's market cap is bigger than the economy of Ghana. Think about it. As a country, 31 million people, yes, we have huge potential, but it's up to us to develop. The 2057 vision, 100 years, is still achievable. By 2030, if Mr. Crantin has his way, and I'm going to quote me, uh, quote me um, in 2030, Mr. Crantin, at least the 500 will be there. It might be... Uh, uh, one billion, it is possible because he's a very dynamic leader and you need to support him when he comes to Takwa. He's not going to build your roads if you don't help him. For me, I keep hammering on about the mindset change. It is very, very important. Awareness campaign, this is one of a series that is going to happen. I did it um, in um, South Africa and Sadek in East Africa. And my intention is to do that so that we can sensitize the youth and also the academic community that, yes, we can. You know, what happens when there's no more natural resources in the raw materials? That is why we need to start now and try and do something to protect whatever we have. Don't be under any illusion that China hasn't got gold. They've got a lot of gold. Can a Ghanaian go to China and do galamsey? Never. So why do we allow it to happen? And then we keep blaming government. There are people in the communities that see it happening, but they don't think about the supply chain implications. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Supply chain started as an internal things to smooth things within um, companies. Now it's become a way to industrialize. Ghana has started, but Ghana needs citizen support. Your support is needed. So please, after this lecture, don't just forget. Please support this industrialization agenda, which has been kicked off by the president with initiatives like 1D1F. For me, it's always about the African child. I was once a child, and somebody fought for me and made sure that I am who I am today. I owe it to my mother and my father. But for me, it is my job to make sure that yourselves, I'm thinking beyond me, I'm thinking of you. You also need to think of me and basically make sure that we protect the future for the African child. I thank you very much. May God bless Ghana. Shall we be outstanding to give Prof a standing ovation? With a round of applause. <laughs> Prof, thank you very much. You may be seated as we take one or two questions. The MC, Honorable Benjamin Kessie, was supposed to be here, but is being represented by Mrs. Amanda Ej Pukua. Please be on your feet and give us a whip. Thank you very much for coming. At this stage, we we'll welcome questions so that Prof would do justice to them for us. So, if you have one, you just raise your hand or you stand up, we bring the microphone to you and you ask accordingly.
So I will start with Dr. Frank Guatin. So the rest, you mention your name, probably where you work or your position, and then you ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Prof, for that wonderful lecture. Uh, Prof, in your delivery, um, you indicated that myth will be spending in exploration. Um, this is a welcoming news because as a country for some time now, um, I think the investments in exploration has actually gone down. And for us, this is what you know, give birth to new mining companies. So that is a very good and a welcoming news. My question, um, as a university, we have an ambition to kind of have a model mines. This model mines is supposed to be used as um, a training facility and then also to generate some form of uh, um, income which will be um, um, revenue to the university to support government's effort in funding this university. Um, will this be an area that MIF would want to explore? Saying this, I know and I, I've, I've read that MIF will be collaborating with the university to have some incubation hubs. Um, we'll be glad to hear that this will be a comprehensive project that will help box all this together so we can use the expertise in this university to help create value. For me, that is part of uh, the efficient use of uh, supply chain. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Okay, let me um, make, make a comment on that. Yes, we will be supporting, uh, but subject to agreement, obviously, and some um, performance uh, agreement between MIF and uh, the university. You know, we also have to be realistic. You know, there are also other competing interests. So the, chair, the CEO, obviously, have to be very careful not to also go and overcommit and not deliver. And it's not that type. So there, there will be a detailed discussion, and it has already started with uh, the VC in terms of what MIF can do and what MIF cannot do. Once you become a billion uh, dollar organization, then it makes it much easier to look at you know, taking more risk Exploration is risk, but it is worth it. I see exploration as an investment. Financiers see it as risk. You know, so we have to be very careful and make sure that whatever risk the financiers are going to take, at the end of the day, the numbers add up. Because for me, if they take risks with three exploration targets and one hits, they will recover the investment for the other two. But it, have to, it has to be done very carefully, and the CEO is coming up with models to ensure that whatever it does, you know, satisfies the shareholder. Also, let's, let's be careful here. There's a lot of education that needs to take place, also with the shareholder, because the shareholder look at things from, in most cases, numbers. MIF is trying to change that paradigm without forgetting the numbers. Let's look at it from numbers plus long-term development. And we believe that, that, that I've seen what Mr. Granton is trying to do. There will be a careful balance. But I'm not expecting that, uh, you know, there will be a, well, I'm expecting a floodgate of uh, applications coming through. But is going to be very selective in terms of what it does. But it will also help with UMAT. We are going to, you know, these days, 
a lot of the JOC and 43101s are done by outside companies. I believe there could be a company within UMAT that will be doing those exercises for myth companies, myth partners. And those discussions are all underway because for me, I'm not apologetic about empowering our own if they can do it and add value. I don't believe in carrying dead weight, but those that can do it, we should help them. And you are more than capable of doing that because in most cases, they hire you to do it anyway on their behalf and then just put their, put their rubber stamp on it. We need to create our own brands and MIF can do that. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is uh, Professor M.A. Akitunde. I work with uh, Mechanical Engineering, UMAT. I really enjoyed the lecture, and I want to appreciate you for such enlightenment. During your lecture, sir, you made me to understand that you are in a privileged position at this time. And during the lecture, you mentioned that the Western world, they may not believe that we cannot do it. But you said we can do it. I've heard a lot about that. My question is this. When are we going to start? Number two, why is it in Africa that we put more money into politics than research? If somebody won the election today, within the next two, three months, he's a billionaire. But even somebody is a professor, to buy a car, oh, you have to sweat. When I look at uh, the instrument they are using for rigging, for digging, for everything, you know, it costs a lot of money. Why is it that those countries, they are putting that money there? For them to do the manufacturing but in africa we cannot do it we rather take our money from ghana go and put it in dubai go and put it in usa go and put it somewhere and they still borrow us the money when are we going to desist from that then lastly i want to suggest we cannot leave our education as free as it is now we have young uh, students that are very good. Software, engineering, all of them. They can do it. Why can't government first such students and challenge them and say, look, one, two, three of you, go and study how to preserve tomato and finance it. You remember in China, they start by throwing challenge to their graduates and back it financially. They give them budget. Go and bring this. And they are doing it. So when are we going to start in Africa? Thank you very much. OK. Thank you very much for the question and also some of it were comments. When are we going to start? It has already started. Believe you me, there's a lot of change happening in Africa. The interruption has come from COVID. Again, slow progress is better than no progress. We are making slow strides. The strides might not be as fast as some of us want it to be. But looking at our very complex history and society, sometimes it's better to go slow. I know the issues in terms of the corruptive practices. That is bedeviling us. I know the unfortunate pay issue with my fellow colleagues. But you know, in all this, we inherited a system which, unfortunately, we've not managed to re-engineer. 
we keep, we keep on what I call adopting rather than adapting. And that has really been a very painful process. Change is happening. Let's be patient. Let's not look for change for ourselves. Let's look for change for the generations to come. When we do that, we may see some of the change, we may not. But at least we've done it for our children. The issues of politicians becoming rich overnight is rather unfortunate. And that will be a discussion at another lecture. We cannot debate that today because today is about industrialization. Yes, they have an impact. But through citizenry support and visionary leadership of Mr. Cranton and what MIF wants to do, slowly we can do little bits in our corner. You can't tackle the whole mess. It has to be done in bits and pieces. Rome was not built in a day. I share with you the frustrations. But let's keep hope alive. For me, it has already started. Because if he hadn't, I would not be here. And a lot of you, even if I'm able to convince one person about the need for industrialization, my job is done. I will give you an example. In 2017, I came to Ghana and I was talking about tiger nuts. Ataji. Anytime I see my mothers on the streets selling Ataji. And I'd already done my homework back in the 2010, 2011 in terms of the market. Countries including Spain, they are part of a 4 billion annual tiger nuts flower market. When I came and I started to talk about the opportunities to group the women in Nkoko and start doing guaranteed offtake. There was a woman in a bank said, Prof, this is a good idea. So we took it upon herself and started that business. To do is, she's got a fledging business and it's also opened up a lot of doors for others. You go to the shops, you see tiger nuts flower. It's working. We are all ambassadors of change. We just need to keep hope alive. Optimism breeds optimism. Pessimism breeds pessimism. Oh, yes, we can. You are frustrated, disillusioned, but believe you me, my dear old professor, the winds of change has already started. My name is Vivian Isabella Seshi. I have two things to talk about now. From your lectures and presentation, I realize that what we really need is to use our own products, try to patronize things that are produced in Ghana. But one thing I've also realized is that government that, let's say, has the bigger capacity to use the things we produce in Ghana, it's not doing it. I remember Pozolana Cement. Government is still building, up, putting up structures, schools, and the likes, but yet they don't use those things that are produced by Ghanaians. I want to find out, I know we have a lot of laws, and I mean so many laws. Do you think to get the government to start using those things, we need laws, or how are we going to get the government to start doing or using the things that are available, the materials that are available in Ghana? The second thing is, I know your outfit, you said after giving the 20% out for community development, you try to invest the rest. In terms of the industrialization, 
I know universities do a lot of research, research that can change the face of Ghana. I know professors changing waste into activated carbon, plastic to petroleum products. Do you think your outfit in investing, they can invest in this research, make it marketable, and then get some money at the same time, creating jobs for others? Do you think your outfits can look into that direction as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good question. Um, in terms of patronizing local goods, sometimes our act, the Act 663, the Public Procurement Act, is not friendly to that because it's very, very also price-driven. Yes, there is a margin of preference in there, but having been the ex-chairman, I realized that that Act 63 needs to be revisited so that there could be room to patronize local goods. And those things um, is going to happen. But government machinery moves very, very slow. So we just have to be patient and keep obviously reinforcing the message so that they will switch to local produce. Another thing which we can do as citizens, I mentioned the chocolate break. How many of you in your offices, when somebody comes and you are offering tea or coffee, it's made in Ghana. You order offer tea or coffee, then now chocolate. Sometimes we perpetuate the whole thing and we have to change that. In terms of the research, we all know of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley started out of um, Stanford University. I mean, it's very close by. If you've been to the US, you will see. They are, very, they are all in a very close proximity. Over time, not just with MIF. MIF cannot do everything. But over time, MIF will be very selective and be able to help to create such a value within the Takwa area. But it will take time. MIF have just started at 978, if I uh, stand corrected. But we need to put certain things in place. We are not thinking tomorrow. We are thinking 20, 30 years ahead. And look, uh, based on the thinking of the chief executive, I am confident that over time there will be money to research and to product development and also taking the product to the market. Because one of the weakest links within the supply chain has also been brand positioning of our products. We are relatively weak at doing that. And there's a lot of scientific innovation from the universities. And I'm sure in my name, uh, UMAT has a lot of products that they want assistance in terms of taking to the market. But it's just a matter of gradually looking at it and looking at the numbers and seeing how we can fund things on a continual basis. I don't believe in starting a project or an initiative and then you do it once and tomorrow it's gone. No. It costs more harm than good. So Mr. Quentin is going through a process right now to create a framework which is sustainable. Once he's done that, then the engagement, which has already started, can be concretized on a number of the initiatives that your good selves have started. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Esso Ismaila is my own name from the Mechanical Engineering Department. Sir, um, I'm aware that um, logistics is a subset of supply chain management. And thank God, from your way from Takuradi to Takwa, <laughs> you saw how the, ro the road was. And road network uh, is also linked to industrialization. I don't know whether MIF is in that position, especially uh, in mines area, whether they, are, they can't also come into that to be able to rehabilitate road network in mines area. Uh, the other one is that um, what I can 
take out from here is that Africans need attitudinal change. And uh, unless we are ready to develop Africa, nobody is ready to develop it for us. Uh, most of the uh, funding agencies are actually taking advantage of us. In the meantime, but in the long run, the younger ones are the ones suffering that. Uh, is there a way by which some of our country, I, I remember that press, um, maybe very recently in South Africa, they were to start manufacturing vaccine. And a lot of issues came uh, from there. Is that a way? Yeah, we have African Union. But to what extent is African Union working towards you know, emancipation of Africa countries towards economic development? Thank you, sir. Thank you for the, the, the question. Uh, in terms of the road, uh, that is uh, not a mandate of MIF. Uh, uh, MIF's role is to invest its funds in mineral related initiatives, not in roads. But there is a way around it where as part of corporate social responsibility, the mining companies, they can be encouraged to do what is right for the communities that they have interest in. Corporate social responsibility. Let's not take away the responsibility of also government. Government's role is to build the infrastructure and then hopefully be able to entice some of these mining companies to build the roads. But for me, in mining areas, if you look around the world, what is needed is the roads for the people and light transportation. You need railways. Very, very important. Because when you are transporting things over the road, you are destroying the road and also causing danger. I mean, coming yesterday and the ducking and diving on the famous Takwa to Takrade, where these big trucks, sometimes you have to go round because the pothole is so big that if your car <laughs> ends up in the pothole, you know, your shaft might just break or even you damage your tires. We need to find a way of building our railways network. And the government is already making very positive strides by having discussions on public-private partnerships so that we can have an integrated rail network and take some of these big tracks off the road because it is not healthy for the roads. In terms of attitudinal change, yes, attitudinal change is needed from all of us and also from the government. And I agree with you on that. Unless we have that change, you know, it's going to be bumping along as usual. Singapore, it took 20 years. They did it. Paul Kagame is doing it in Rwanda. When you go to Rwanda and you put a plastic, you will live in there because there's what is called discipline in society. Something just went wrong. For me as a child, there was discipline. I would have been embarrassed to throw, throw a, a black plastic. But these days, people don't care. They just do it. And now we have to pay sanitation tax to collect the waste that we generate ourselves. Who do you blame? Ourselves. So attitudinal change is very, very important. All is not lost. Ghanaians, we have something within us. And even within West Africans, that's something tough gets going. We are able to change. And the classic case is COVID. The world was predicting that we are going to we are going to have dead bodies on the roadside. Did we? No. In here, everybody is wearing his mask. Go to the US today. They are so indisciplined. We have our issues. But collectively, we are able to make a change. And we've proven it with COVID 
and with our economic emancipation drive, oh yes, we can. It's just we are at a tipping point right now. And this issue late with the IMF and the World Bank debate is getting all of us to think, is that really the solution? Or we can have our own solutions. And then go to them when we are not so desperate. Who has ever gone to the bank when desperate and the bank has been favorable? They squeeze you more on their terms. So be positive. We are making progress. Be positive. Thank you. Okay. My name is Isaac King Ampi. Um, I'm Grogo Dashanti. Um, you mentioned in your lecture, Prof, that uh, you are not a protectionist. But this situation we have, we have a nation to develop. Here is the case. You also looked at our consumption pattern and how that is impacting on our current situation, where we create employment for outsiders. I know all the policy makers are aware. What is preventing us from shaping our policy to ensure we encourage indigenous industrialization when it comes to uh, consumption and other things? Because these things, I believe, when it's done right, would even instigate the change that we are actually wishing for. Because with that change, we can accelerate. But if we leave it as it stands now, nobody will go to the market and buy five CDs, at least five CDs worth of an item, go for 25 CDs, because it thinks what 25 is made in Ghana. Our state policies discourage us from taking initiatives that will encourage industrialization from within. Why is it that the leadership, political or other industrial players, don't act to encourage the required behavior change. Thanks. Thank you. Um, contrary to popular belief, the policies are there. It's just the strategy and the implementation where there's unfortunately a disconnect. And part of the reason why there's a disconnect is that people don't really understand the concept of the total acquisition cost of ownership. I will try and illustrate this with an example. We all buy printers. These days, the prices of printers ranges between, you can get one for 500 CDs to 5,000 CDs. Now, there's something called cartridges that are used in the printer. So when you buy a printer for 500 CDs, almost every two weeks, you'll be changing the cartridge. When you buy a printer for 5,000 CDs, you'll be changing your cartridge every six months. Now, those cartridges and the 500 might be costing you 250. And the more you change, the more money you're spending on the same printer. Work that over a year, you will realize that the 500 CDs printer has cost you 10,000, as opposed to the 5,000 that will cost you 7,000, because you change cartridges twice a year. Ghanaians, we don't do that. And it's in our habit to go for cheap. Every weekend, there's funeral. And Ashanti's, we perfected the art of funerals. The t-shirts that we wear, how long does it last? As soon as you put it in a washing machine, it's gone. But we keep on buying the same thing over and over again. 
consumption patterns is because we do not understand. People buy Mercedes for a reason. People buy Hyundai for a reason. We also don't take into account the cost of time. I've seen in Tanzania where a driver bought a, a, a light, the light, the headlight. He took me from the airport and he was rushing. Original headlight from the same manufacturer, Hyundai, would have cost him 12,000 T shillings. But he preferred a no name brand which cost 1,500. Now, because of that, at night, he has to finish work at 6 because when it's too dark, the lights was dangerous because it would not really, <coughs> you know, give the, 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 the right headway. Once we start educating our people about the total cost of ownership, consumption patterns will change. Are you aware that the tomatoes you buy, the chemical in there is cancerous? Some of these tomatoes. And I've put it out there. When you open it and you leave it, it can, it can become carcinogenic. But it is cheap and we don't take those things into account. Consumption patterns will change when people understand what is called the total cost of ownership. Apply it to the roads. Every year, what happens? We keep on having to redo it. And it's costing us more and more and more. We have to find a way of spending more upfront to save the heartache later. And when you start thinking about supply chain, God forbid, the Takwa to Takwa Day and many other roads of, uh, without mentioning names. There's an implication for healthcare. Because if something happens, you are taking the person to the hospital. So it puts pressure also on our hospitals. The darkening and diving has implications for the car, the tires, wear and tear. All these things are all supply chain thinking. So you spend a bit more to gain the long-term benefits. Consumption patterns is dependent on total cost of ownership. Even the paper that you use in your printers has an implication for your cost. So if you go for cheap paper, you are using more ink and it's costing you more. That is all consumption patterns. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Uh, my name is Abdel Halim from Anglo Goda Shanti, Edua Premai. I'm privileged. So, um, in terms of the protectionism, I am not an advocate of protection. All I'm saying is let's safeguard and find a creative way of ensuring that some companies are in a way creatively, you know, pulled up in the value chain. Because once they are stable, they can be able to compete. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Once again, I'm Abdel Halim from Anglo Goda Shanti, Edward Primai. I'm privileged to be here with my senior manager in the person of uh, engineer Isaac Wache Edueni. He's sitting on the front seat. Uh, Prof, Welcome. I have two questions. Uh, I see the volume of procurement, some of them in the mind, and when you just suppose it with the local content, you see a mismatch in terms of the quantum of values involved. Uh, I'm of the view that most of the country that has developed more or less as some element of protectionism in their 
business. And then it's skewed towards the foreign supplies. Can we, from where you sit, I believe you are in a position that is quite close to the, to the authorities. That's the power. Can we look at legislation that can limit the volume that we repatriate back outside the country at our own detriment? And the one you look at it from even central government, government remain the biggest procurement in the country, undoubtedly. And the one you look at most of the parastata organization and look at their procurement, you realize that, to quote your own word, we are our own enemies. We mostly tend to buy the foreign items when we need to maybe spend a little bit higher so that we can promote our own organization. Um, the question is, can we look at legislation that can empower the buying of the local items at the expense of the foreign items. Until we do that, I'm, believe, I'm of the view that uh, uh, it will remain a, a discussion. So we should have an enforcement that can force us to buy the made in Ghana items so that we can industrialize, we can improve. So that's the challenge to you when you get the opportunity to talk to the people that can bring the legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I, I hear you. Uh, most of the public sector procurement is guided by Act 63 with amended 914. The policies are there. I've always maintained that it has to be revisited because it's not helping with local wealth creation and empowerment. The discussions has already started, but as I mentioned earlier, government machinery moves very, very slow. They are aware. To get around some of these challenges, the government obviously in Act 63 came up with single and sole sourcing. Now, unfortunately, some of this has been abused. But I am still hopeful that because now there's a wake-up call, thanks to, and no thanks to COVID, there are changes coming with the government procurement. Because you cannot keep going and buying foreign if there's a local substitute that can do the same job. And it's just a matter of time. You know, Africa is the largest exporter of foreign currency to go and bring goods into the continent for consumption. The government have now realized that, and they want to do it through after. The money should stay on the continent, because if the money stays on the continent, it will help with the developmental agenda of the continent. So yes, there are issues. We need to find a way of, I wouldn't say forcing, you force them, people find ways. We need to convince people that it's in their own interest. And having sat at PPA before, I've seen quite a few of public sector organizations that are already changing, even in spite of the fact that Act 63 had to be visited. They are finding creative without breaking the law, without breaking the law, to make sure that locals also get a fair share of the pie. Private sector is much more easier for your good self to do. It's just the procurement um, leader needs to think beyond performance and look at what is in the interest of also the, 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 the nation that they have business interest in and what will be the benefit to the organization if they pay a little bit more for a local. It happens. I've been in projects where I've even helped a company in Cape Town, a young guy that used to do scaffolding for a company, a refinery company. 
and he was one of the guys there. And I helped to convince the organization, Engine, to look at empowering this young man at a small extra fee to take over the scaffolding at the, the, the site. Today, the guy is sending over 400 million, but even cheaper than the competition. The foreign company is still there, but we have to create a local company that competes with the uh, foreign company. As Anglo Gold can quite do that. It's just a policy that you need to come up with that this is what we are going to do. Identify serious, long-term driven local companies that you can pull up it comes at a cost, but there's also a long-term benefit because you've created to create jobs in the community that you have business interest. It is doable. I've been there. I've done it in Southern Africa, Botswana, Tanzania, Zimbabwe. Not, it's not book talk. I was part of it. And some of these copper mines, they've changed and been able to bring locals up through company policy and the implementation. So it's doable. Private sector is much easier than public. Although in Ghana, public is the largest procurer. So it becomes a bit tricky when you have an act. And then you have to go and revisit and amend certain parts to make sure that it is in the interest of locals. But there are creative ways without breaking the law. And it is working currently in our beloved Ghana. Thank you. Right, we are picking two more questions. And if you missed any part of the presentation, you can visit the UMAT Facebook or YouTube account to watch and rewatch. Hello. <coughs> Thank you, Prof, for your incisive lecture this morning. Prof, a debate has come currently whether we should go to IMF or not. The little history we studied was that when the white men came, as far back as 1482, after they had built the castle, they started bringing in textiles, minerals for our forefathers, and our forefathers were compelled to give them gold as far back as 1482. We learned Obwasi mine has been mined for over 100 years, and economists are saying the unfair share of African wealth, that is why African countries are in poverty. We also learned that the white man will come and place his uh, machine for exploration of our wealth. And Prof, isn't it so sad? I'm also happy that you are saying you are an Africanist. Isn't it so sad that they repatriate the uh, most chunk of our capital? We learned that they take away 90% and give us 10%. Prof, isn't it one of the factors of our poverty? So at this juncture, can't our leaders sit down with them, renegotiate that this is unfair? That is why we have to come to you when we are lacking in funds, and therefore you have to give us directives, not to give us public sector employment and such. So Prof, my main question is, can't we go and sit down and renegotiate with them? Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Fourteen eighty two. I wasn't born, so <laughs> it will be difficult to comment on what, um, if I recall, John Diego de Azambuja, the Portuguese, that obviously came and took our gold. But going back to um, the issue of real negotiation, you know, my experience and um, Ghana our beloved motherland, right now is trying to force a lot of initiatives, getting the African leaders to also think about what is it that we want. You can only negotiate when you know what you want. Sometimes we go into negotiations without knowing what we want. This backwards and forwards with the IMF and the British agency. Some people agree with government, some people disagree with government. Some people say we should go to them. Some people are saying no. My view, I stand corrected, that the timing is wrong for us to go. Because we know the problems. We are not collecting enough money. 
the tax kitty is too narrow. We need to widen it. How do we do it? Innovative solutions. Once you are in a better position, you can go and sit down with your so-called developmental partners and countries and negotiate. Right now, to go and sit down with them, you are going to negotiate from a very weak position. Africa is the richest continent in the world. There is poverty in Africa, but Africa is certainly not poor. There's a difference. The poverty has been created by us, and we can correct it. And the only way we correct it is to basically spend money on basically identifying what is it that we have and the value. And then we can go and sit down with these guys and negotiate and say, look, these terms and conditions, it's not favorable. And we have to be prepared to walk away. I always say an agreement is not because you signed. When you walk away from an agreement, that is also an agreement. You don't want it. But right now, when we go, because we have our tail in our legs, whatever they say, we basically accept. And it's because we have not really done our homework. You know, when the president made a bold statement that we need to look at these rating agencies, he has a point. But somehow, we become so emotional about this issue that we are not looking at what he's saying. America by 2029 will be ba virtually bankrupt because of the way they are printing money, quantitative easing. But they still got triple A. Why? Because they've created the impression that they can pay their debt, which is true. Yes, they can possibly pay their debt. But they've ignored the China factor. Most of the manufacturing right now is in China. And they owe so much to China. I'm not saying that we are America. I'm saying that there has to be a level playing field, you know. But unless you are able to, to, to obviously um, know what you have, then you can go out there and really renegotiate some of these terms and conditions. I believe what they are trying, trying to get them to rethink about this whole rating thing is a good thing. Nothing might come out of it, but at the end of the day, it's a warning shot that you can't just say that we are junk when you don't have the facts. Let the facts tell us that we are junk. Ghana is not broke. Ghana is growing, but not at a pace that we want it to. Period. Ghana is not broke. Let the so-called experts prove to me that Ghana is broke. We have interest payments to pay. So does every country. We just have to basically find a way of generating more income. And it doesn't happen tomorrow. It takes a while. And that is what industrialization is all about. So that the dependency culture would obviously be minimized. South Africa is doing it. How many times do you hear South Africa going to the IMF? They've rejected some of their um, uh, loans because they want to chart their own destiny. Yes, when the timing is right, they go there. But believe you me, how did they take money from the IMF? Because they have a strong industrial base. Are you aware that South Africa is among the top 50 industrialized countries in the world? They produce, and they are going to keep producing. Thanks to after, that economy could easily become a trillion dollar company, uh, organize, uh, country, because they have a huge manufacturing base. I know it because I live there. And it's very impressive. Ghana can do the same. Thank you. Um, thank you, Prof, for that spectacular and beautiful presentation. My name is Abdul Rahman Imad, an electrical engineering student, level 200. Um, prof, there seem to be 
an over concentration of the creation of industries within our urban areas while leaving our uh, rural areas. What might have been the problem and how do we shift from this and sustainably build, uh, create industries within our rural areas and tap into the natural resources within those rural areas because there are a lot of rural areas that are endowed with a lot of natural resources that can contribute to our industrial growth and development. And secondly, in your presentation, you said um, there's a difference between economic growth and economic development. And you cited in one breath that between 2017 and 2020, before COVID hit, Ghana experienced some positive economic strides. I don't know. Within those, that period, can you consider it as economic growth or economic development? Thank you. Okay. When you, you look at the issue or the opportunities between 2017 and 2020, it was a combination of economic growth and economic development. But the economic growth was driven more by commodity exports our oils and our gold and our manganese and all host of also um, raw materials. If you really want long-term infrastructure development, you spend money to develop the nation. Why is the U.S. so keen to sign up the bill to help with infrastructure? They want to boost economic development because as you are developing the country, you are basically employing jobs and you're widening the tax net. There were policies in place during 2017 to 2020, which was beginning to take shape. And then COVID hit. When COVID hit, it became a challenge. And we all have to obviously go back to the drawing board again and make sure that um, that um, we are able to find a way of kickstarting the economic development. So there is a difference. You will get fantastic numbers from economic growth when you export. They will tell you you're doing this and that, but it doesn't really translate into meaningful long-term jobs. I hope I've answered your question. Was there a second question? Uh, repeat the second question again. The first question was about uh, the creation of industry, over concentration of the creation of industries yes. within the urban areas, while okay. living the rural areas. Okay, yes. The reason why, and I stand corrected on this, based on my observation, the reason why there's a concentration of industries in the urban areas is because of infrastructure. That is one of the reasons. And unless the rural infrastructures are developed to a certain point, it will be difficult and challenging for companies to relocate. But nonetheless, there are opportunities in agriculture, whereby if there is guaranteed uptake from some of these small, small community farmers, they will stay there. The buy-in and lack of infrastructure in the rural is what is causing the rural urban migration, which is, for me, if it's not corrected, could be very dangerous because nobody can, not everybody can live in Accra or Kumasi. In between, there's nothing. And it's because of the infrastructure. We need to find a way of getting jobs to move there, uh, uh, companies to move into those areas. And the only way you do that is to offer incentives and also create the infrastructure so that when they produce in those areas, it can easily be transported to where it is needed. Right now, there's this disconnect and it's all to do with logistics. Logistics is more than just the transportation. You have to plan all these things. When you look at the cocoa board, they have strategic locations whereby they put their cocoa. That was supposed to spare an industry in its own right, but because of lack of infrastructure, it ended up at just warehouses. It has not really been able to spare um, the, the, the emergence of new industries in certain areas. 
So is Timba. Um, uh, Dr. Nkrumah was very smart, you know, setting up a, a, a tire factory close to the rubber plantations. But unfortunately, due to lack of, um, you know, expert management, it all collapsed. And also our buying habits, the cheap importation also helped to kill that uh, factory. And there are so many of these examples around the country. So it's up to us and government to find a way of creating that infrastructure and incentives. When you go to South Africa, they do it. Now Rwanda is doing it. Um, Britain, um, I saw it. They did it in the Midlands and in the Northeast. Incentives. And now they've got their money back. We can do that. Um, in the auto, auto sector, the government has come up with some incentives which has brought the likes of Volkswagen here. And it's going to create an automotive cluster, a whole host of industries around it. But the problem is, it is in Accra, in the, the, the Accra region, I think, and also in the industrial area of, of Tema. I, I don't know exactly where it is, but it's certainly not in a rural area. We need to find a way of drawing these companies, especially within the agricultural sector, to locate to the farm areas. And then get the sustained through incentives. You get your money back through a lot of job creation and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. I believe we are all enlightened. Unfortunately, we can't pick any more questions because we've gone beyond our time. And like Prof said, I know everyone has his or her takeaway message. I have mine, that our raw materials or our talents are not enough. We should invest in them for generations to come. So I believe we are all going out with something. Shall we once again be on our feet and give Prof an understanding ovation? You can do it better for Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. And can we give the Faculty of Engineering a boza for this wonderful organization? Right, I did say we call on the first gentleman of the university, the vice chancellor, to give his closing remarks. VC. Please sit down. VC, Thank you very much. I think he deserves another round of applause for talking and also for taking all the questions. Once again, I would want to thank everybody here for coming. I'm happy about the numbers. I think apart from congregation, we hardly get such high numbers for programs in Yuma. So clap for yourselves as well. Thank you very much. We have had a very wonderful presentation, and I will not make any attempt to summarize it. But some key points that came up that I want to mention as part of the closing remarks has to do with supply chain thinking. Supply chain thinking. I know that there's a course called supply chain management. Though we may not take that course, let us have that supply chain thinking so that it would go through and help with the way we do things. There is one policy that President Kufo made. He said on Fridays, everybody should wear made in Ghana clothing. And that policy alone has changed the dynamics of the tailoring industry in Ghana. And I believe that if we continue to do some of these things, um, our country will get industrialized. Nigeria needs $5 billion worth of salt. And they cannot find it in West Africa. They have to go to Brazil and Argentina to bring it down. And in Ghana, we have a very long coast. What do we do with it? Some shit on their coast and some litigate the land. And because of that, the total amount of salt we produce is less than 300,000 tons. If we are able to do that, I believe that we'll be on the road to industrialization. What I can gather from the talk is that as a university, 
we also have to be more business-like. We have to continue training our world-class professionals. We have to get good certificates out. And in addition to that, we have to get good skills as well so that people can go out with skills and a certificate in order to change the dynamics of society. He talked about the fact that we should be able to go into Africa and set up satellite campuses. And I want to put on record that currently, UMAT is in Sierra Leone. And we will be commissioning that satellite campus in the next few months. It is important that we engage each other. He said that the CEO wants to build the biggest kind of fund, $500 million assets under management. And I want to believe that the professionals sitting here, both students and, and people who have graduated, we should be able to put units together. We have the UMAT company already running. Some of you can hide under the UMAT company. Some of you can form companies, geologists. Put yourselves together, exploration teams, mining teams, surveying teams, so that when MIF says that we want to go to Asankregua to maybe possibly put a concession together, the people who would do the exploration will come from UMAT, and the people who do the mining will come from UMAT. And after the gold has been obtained, people from our jewelry center will convert it into jewelry for the common good of Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, VC, for your closing remarks. We have some companies in our midst, and we want to acknowledge them. OK. So we have nasal oil for it and suppliers. Can you give us a wave? Okay. BCM Ghana. Okay. ID Ga College. Okay. Ghana National Chamber of Commerce. Jela Electronics Services. Grasa. Myth. The main sponsor. Trust Account Consult. Anglo Gold Ashanti, a dropping mine, limited. Aboso Gophos. Teaching and research. Teaching and research assistant. Okay. Service personnel. Students. Van okay. Ghana Limited. Then we also have Dramatic Company Limited. Qatar. Right. We thank you all for coming. And before the vote of thanks is shared, we want to have the university anthem at this stage. So let's be on our feet for the university anthem.
Shall we please take our seats? It's time to call Ms. Veronica Branksen to give us the vote of thanks. Let's give a round of applause as she comes. A graceful and good afternoon to our cherished guests from the industries, academia, students, all other protocol duly observed. I'm privileged to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee. Our most sincere thanks goes to the Almighty Father for a successful program. Special thanks to the speaker of the day, Professor Douglas Watson, for the valuable information you've shared with us this present time. I would like to express our deep gratitude to the CEO of Minerals Income Investment Fund for sparing time from your busy schedule to grace the occasion, and to MIIF for the enormous cooperation in the organization of this event. We are grateful to our Vice Chancellor, the management of the university, and the Dean of Faculty of Engineering for the guidance and moral support. And to all participants from the industry, we appreciate your time with us today, and we hope you've benefited by being here. I'm happy to express our appreciation to all staff and students of this noble university for making this program a grand success. Once again, I say thank you for your cordial cooperation. God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Cranston, for the vote of thanks. So, our phone. Dr. Peter Nyako to give us a closing prayer. Let's give it up to him. May we humbly be upstanding for the closing prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for such a wonderful program this afternoon. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And just as you started with us, so have you brought us to the end of this function. We thank you for the life of the guest speaker and his entourage. Whatever virtues that has gone out of the speaker, it is our prayer that you will replenish it. We also commit our sponsors and of this program into your mighty hands increase in all their endeavors so that this series of space will continue forever until you come back as always oh Lord, we pray that we may have a change of mindset to help us to develop our communities and the nation as a whole I commit all audience into your mighty hands, Lord. People have traveled from far and near to this program. We are praying for your service as we go to our various destination. Once again, we say we thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Please don't be in a hurry to go. I told you to count the items. We are now on top left at one to make it 13 and that is where the interest lies but at this you will take your seat at this stage so that management and the MILF will take some pictures before we leave
Because the item 13 is socialization and lunch. Right, this stage, the socialization can begin. Right, um, studio, please. They want to take one or two interviews so you can 